Hello, and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Before we get started, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more from me. If you really want to support us, you can join my Patreon. We have a big goal there, and I'll talk about that at the end of the video. Once a while, a story comes along that reminds us there are organizations and forces in this world that are not always what they appear to be. You know I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist, but you don't have to be in order to acknowledge the fact that our government is capable of very bad deeds. The question today is, did it commit this one? When a Hollywood screenwriter stumbled on a story that made very powerful people look really bad, his life went into free fall, and then he vanished. He was found, but when he was, there were more questions than answers for the people who knew him. This is the strange story of the writer with no hands, the story of Gary DeVore. I'm your host, Stacey Lee. Let's get into it. June 28, 1997. 55-year-old Gary DeVore is on his way home from Santa Fe, New Mexico, to his home in Santa Barbara, California. Gary was a Hollywood screenwriter, and he'd worked on some very big films with big actors. Raw Deal with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Heart of Steel with Peter Strauss and John Goodman, The Dogs of War with Christopher Walken and Tom Berenger, and Running Scared with Billy Crystal, Gregory Hines, and Joe Pantoliano. Those were all on his resume, and he was a very well-respected and popular screenwriter for action films, buddy films, and action comedy films. But that's not what Gary had been working on in June of 1997. Gary DeVore had stumbled upon something that he was being very secretive about, and he was concerned. He was stressed out, and he seemed to be carrying a heavy burden. He had been in Santa Fe, New Mexico working. He had an office there at a friend's house, and he was trying to finish a script before a looming deadline. Before he left for Santa Fe, he was complaining to his wife that he'd had writer's block, and he decided that a change of scenery and location might help ease his bout and boost his creativity. That's why he'd been in Santa Fe, trying to get inspiration. He finally did finish the script, and relieved, he decided to head home. He called his wife, Wendy, the morning of June 28th and told her he was going to drive home through the Mojave Desert to relax and clear his head, and he would be at their beachfront home in Carpentaria, California around 3 a.m. or so. Gary DeVore never arrived. The search is on tonight for a local screenwriter who never arrived back home from an out-of-town trip. The Highway Patrol and the L.A. County Sheriff's Department have both been on the lookout for any sign of DeVore's car, and so far, they tell us they have nothing to report. Gary DeVore didn't make it home that night. Gary DeVore didn't make it home at all. He had vanished off the face of the earth. A massive search ensued. How could this man and his vehicle have completely disappeared, especially after he'd just spoken with his wife, assuring her that he was on his way home? Police and volunteers and highway patrol went up and down the highways and freeways that Gary would have driven on from Santa Fe to Santa Barbara. They looked in ditches and fields, and for a while, they were sure it was a car accident. They fully expected to find Gary's car off the road somewhere, perhaps down a mountainside, and they searched intently, trying to find him in case he had been in an accident and was unable to leave his vehicle. They wanted to get to him in time to save his life if he had been injured. They looked for days, and then a week, and then two weeks, and they found absolutely nothing. There was no sign of Gary or his vehicle. There had not been an accident. No John Doe's had been admitted to the hospitals anywhere on the path of Gary's journey. And everyone involved was completely baffled as to how a man disappears like this. Gary's wife, Wendy, was beside herself. And along with Gary's friends, she continued looking for her husband. There was something strange bothering her that had happened. Within about a week of Gary's disappearance, Wendy was visited at home by agents from the FBI, the CIA, NSA, and DOD, Department of Defense. When some of these men had come to Wendy's home, they asked to come inside and look around. And Wendy reports on one day, kind of before she knew what was happening, a couple of them were in Gary's office. Now, she didn't think much of it at the time. She thought they were trying to help with the search. 
but later on, this would turn out to be a very big deal. A couple of weeks after Gary disappeared, Wendy went into his office and turned on the computer to download and make more copies of this missing flyer that she wanted to continue to distribute through the area. Well, when the computer booted up, Wendy could see that the entire thing had been wiped. There was no information at all on the hard drive. Even the screensaver that Gary had always used, it was a family photograph, was gone. Everything was gone. She sat back and thought about the week after Gary disappeared, finding those agents in Gary's office, and she realized they must have been the ones that erased all of the information on Gary's hard drive. And then, of course, she's wondering, why would they do that? Well, let's talk a little bit about who Gary DeVore was. Gary DeVore was born in September of 1941. He had a short stint as a truck driver, and then he began his writing career in the late 1960s, writing for shows like The Steve Allen Show and The Newlywed Game. He had success there and moved up to the movies, where he began writing full screenplays. He married singer Maria Cole, who is Nat King Cole's ex-wife. He married her in 1969, and they divorced in 1978. Then Gary married Claudia Christian in 1988. Claudia is known for her roles on Babylon 5 and Blood for Zeus. Gary and Claudia were only married a few years. They divorced in 1992. And then after that, Gary dated Janet Jackson for a while. He ran in really famous circles. Finally, he married Wendy Oates in 1996. Gary was Tommy Lee Jones' best man at his wedding. His film, The Big Steel, was a huge success and featured details about the U.S. invasion of Panama that most people didn't know. So, like I say, he had a very big career. In the early 1990s, Gary worked as vice president of production at De La Rentis Entertainment Group. You know that company from films like Maximum Overdrive, Blue Velvet, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Evil Dead 2. Gary didn't love this corporate desk job and soon he went back to writing. And there's something else you need to know about Gary DeVore. He had a very unusual pinky finger on his right hand. He had broken that finger years ago and never bothered to have it set. And when it healed, it didn't heal properly and it stuck out to the side, almost horizontally from his hand. It was a very distinctive feature, one that you couldn't miss. Now, Gary also had a lot of opinions about politics. He really despised politicians, but he was also kind of obsessed with the people that had special access to government secrets. Gary's second wife, Claudia, says that Gary thought all politicians were idiots and dangerous, but he also found their world very intriguing, especially the world of the CIA. In fact, Gary's latest screenplay was about the government and some of the more clandestine facets of it. People around Gary knew that he was talking with people who had top secret clearance as he was writing, and they knew that he was kind of poking around in circles, trying to get an element of authenticity for his story. It was not lost on the people who knew Gary that he had been speaking to people who move in very secret circles and who have very important and sometimes dangerous information at the time he disappeared. And they began to wonder, could his script have something to do with his disappearance? Just after Wendy had moved in with Gary before they were married, Gary told her that if she was ever home alone, not to be alarmed if calls came in from government numbers. Now, this was back when caller ID was still somewhat new. To be able to see who was calling you was a new feature, and most of us had these little caller ID boxes attached to our landlines. And so Gary told Wendy, you know, you might see some of these numbers coming from, you know, US government or things like that on the caller ID. Don't be worried about that. Remember the caller ID boxes? Now I just need to go take some Metamucil and watch The Mentalist. <laughs> but anyway, Gary told Wendy, you know, this is a normal occurrence, don't worry about it. Wendy said for the first three or four years of their relationship, she only remembers seeing calls from the government numbers a couple of times. But in the weeks leading up to Gary's disappearance, she got quite a few calls from the CIA at Langley, and again, this didn't seem that unusual because Gary was writing about CIA activity. He had connections in the CIA. The script he was writing in Santa Fe was the story about the CIA. The story was about a group of American operatives robbing a Panamanian bank to cover up for something much more serious. The robbery in the story was to be a diversion for a much larger operation. 
On the night Gary disappeared, like I said, he called Wendy and told her he was headed home. He had packed up all of his research papers and loaded them into the car along with his Toshiba laptop. He also had with him the final draft of the script as well as research on the computer's hard drive. It was going to take Gary quite a while to drive home and at about 1.15 in the morning, Wendy decided to call Gary and check in on him. Cell phones were quite new at this point in time, but Gary did have one. When Wendy called Gary, she reminded him that he had planned a party for the next day to watch the now infamous boxing match between Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield. So Wendy said, don't forget, you've got friends coming over tomorrow. And then she said, I'm gonna wait up for you. And Gary said, no, don't do that. This caught Wendy off guard, as usually Gary would want her to wait up for him. She detected something in his voice that made her concerned and she said, Gary, are you all right? Gary responded, I'm pumping pure adrenaline here. And Wendy asked again, are you okay? And Gary simply said, I'll see you later. And he hung up the phone. That was the last time Wendy ever spoke to Gary. The search for the vanished screenwriter wore on, but six months in, there were only a few people still looking for Gary. The news stories had stopped being printed and aired, and frankly, most people had forgotten about this strange disappearance. And then they found him. July 8, 1998. An amateur detective named Douglas Crawford contacted authorities and said he had a hunch as to where Gary DeVore might be found. A few days earlier, a car was found here, in this aqueduct, after going off the road. The authorities informed this detective that that aqueduct had already been searched, not only by helicopters, but by people on the ground. Still, for whatever reason, they thought they'd check it out again. A team arrived at the aqueduct, and as police did a cursory search of the area, they saw something. They realized it was a vehicle. There, under the freeway above, was Gary DeVore's white Ford Explorer completely submerged below a bridge in Palmdale, California. Something about this was not right at all. Dive teams were sent into the waters, as you can see here. More police gathered at the scene and everyone waited with bated breath to see what information the dive team returned with. When they surfaced, they gave the signal. Gary DeVore's body was in the car. But there was something very noticeable, even to the divers in the murky waters. Gary DeVore was missing both of his hands. A wrecker was brought in and slowly the car was raised from its watery grave. It was towed off to police headquarters where forensics teams began to work on the vehicle and remove Gary DeVore's body from the car. One thing became immediately apparent. Gary DeVore's Toshiba laptop was missing. It was nowhere in the car, and with the windows rolled all the way up and all of his other possessions there, why would the laptop be missing? There was something else missing. Gary's ever-present firearm and all of its ammunition, a gun and ammunition he always kept under the seat of his car. Now, let's talk about the accident scene. First off, for Gary DeVore to have driven into the aqueduct, he would have had to have been going the opposite direction from the way he was traveling. As you can see here, there is a bridge with two two-lane highways on it. One side of the highway goes one direction and the other side goes in the opposite direction. There is a point on the bridge where there is a small opening that is mostly surrounded by guardrails. For Gary's car to have ended up where it was found, he would have had to have made a U-turn from the direction he was traveling, turn back the way he came, and then drive directly into the small opening in the bridge to fall through and land where the car ended up. First off, why would Gary have turned around? He was headed home. It was late. His wife was waiting for him. There would be no reason for him to stop and make a U-turn and head in the opposite direction. Second, he'd driven this path before and he was fully aware of the opening between the lanes and the drop below to the aqueduct underneath. It gets even more strange. As forensic scientists go through the car, they realize that the headlights are in the off position and the gas pedal is fully compressed, meaning the car would have been going around 85 miles an hour when it hit the aqueduct. 
There are also multiple do not enter signs along the freeway alerting drivers that they are on the wrong side of the road and nearing the opening. Now remember, Gary had been a long haul truck driver before becoming a screenwriter. He knew to pull over if he was tired. And also, he had just told his wife that he was running on pure adrenaline. He wasn't falling asleep. But Wendy does admit that when she last spoke with Gary, he sounded strange and agitated. He was short with her. There's more. When Gary's body was found, he was wearing his seat belts and he also had his wallet in his back pocket. Gary was notorious for never wearing a seat belt. He had a lot of people in his life and it was well known that Gary hated wearing a seat belt. No one can ever remember ever seeing Gary put a seat belt on. And another thing, he never ever carried his wallet in his back pocket, especially when he drove. So we've got a missing laptop, a missing gun, missing ammunition, a guy who never wears his seatbelt found with his seatbelt on, lights in the off position at night, a car in an aqueduct that had already been searched after the disappearance, and this screenwriter dead inside missing his hands. What on earth was going on here? Not long after Gary's car and body were discovered, some hand bones were found in the same area. The problem is the bones could not be conclusively linked to Gary. And one doctor who has examined the bones state they're over 200 years old. He says there is no way they're linked to Gary. On top of that, you have to take into account that Gary had this very obvious deformity, this pinky finger that stuck out almost horizontally from his hand. Then Wendy is shocked when she reads the autopsy and identification report. The autopsy report claims that Gary's identification has been confirmed by dental records showing his bridge work. Gary DeVore had never had any bridge work done. For my foreign viewers here in the States, I don't know what you call it, but if you're missing teeth and they put fake teeth in the spot where the teeth are missing, that's called a bridge. Now, this is the point in the story where we need to talk about the documentary. The documentary film about this incident is called The Writer With No Hands, and I got a lot of information from that documentary, so I need to give them credit for a lot of this story. It's on Paramount Plus, and you can also watch it here on YouTube. It's a good documentary. I would definitely suggest watching it if you're interested in this story. The documentary picks up years after Gary goes missing. There's a British writer and professor named Matthew Alford, and he becomes obsessed with this story. And I mean obsessed. His living room and his shed are entirely full of information on Gary DeVore. Matthew's got bulletin boards and photos, accident reports, forensic findings, everything he can get pinned up on his walls. Matthew admits that he is up to his neck in this story and he is determined to find out what happened to Gary. So he contacts Gary's widow, Wendy, and then he contacts a filmmaker to follow him. Matthew then heads out for California to stay there as he works with Wendy in order to reach some conclusions on Gary's death. He actually promises Wendy that he won't leave California without solving the case. So Matthew lands in California and sets up shop but one day as the filmmaker and Matthew were talking, Matthew makes a shocking admission to the filmmaker he has enlisted to assist him documenting this project. Matthew claims to know why Gary DeVore was so agitated in the weeks leading up to his death. Matthew knows what Gary had stumbled onto and it is shocking. Manuel Noriega, the dictator of Panama, had secretly videotaped senior U.S. officials having sex with children. Minor prostitutes provided to these officials by people trying to get their bad deeds on video. You know, people are just so damned disgusting. I, I'm going through this thing right now where I've become convinced that there is a whole segment of males that don't even like women. They don't want to be friends with women. They don't like spending time with women, but they're straight-ish. So they'd just rather have like, what words can I use here? A human body to do with what they want that doesn't come with any type of accountability or relationship or human connection. I mean, I'm gonna stop because I'm gonna start rambling, but I have been going down some rabbit holes lately that have really, I don't know, I got some new thoughts on all of this. Matthew even has some copies of the videotapes. I'm showing you the blurred screenshots of those tapes now. You can't see much, and these wouldn't hold up in any kind of court, but the claims are that this image, these images that I'm showing you are from those tapes. I can't verify that that's true. 
So why didn't anyone ever hear about this? Why didn't anyone ever hear about this huge scandal? One single British newspaper printed one single story about these allegations one time, and then the story was killed, absolutely buried, and no one ever spoke of it again. Not only that, but the man who wrote this one and only story, the only story ever printed about these tapes, got shot by a sniper outside one day and his murder was never solved. Like I say, I'm not much of a conspiracy theorist, but this doesn't sound like much of a conspiracy to me. It sounds pretty, pretty bad. Matthew only came upon this article in the British Library after he began really digging around on these allegations. Was Gary DeVore about to divulge a pedophile ring where children were trafficked to senior US officials? Was Gary murdered because of what he knew? As if everything I've told you about so far in this episode is not strange enough, Matthew starts to meet with people very close to this story and is shocked to find out that most of them do not believe the body in the car pulled from the aqueduct belonged to Gary DeVore. Matthew began to find out that the people closest to this story didn't believe Gary had been murdered because they didn't believe Gary was dead. The main reason for this? The search for Gary was massive. Gary was rich and he was famous in Hollywood circles. There were hundreds of people tracing his path home. Every jail was contacted, every hospital was contacted, emergency clinics were contacted, and every foot of that road had been searched by land and by air, and those involved are confident that car and that body was not in that aqueduct in the week after Gary DeVore went missing. Now, not everyone close to the story has come right out and said why they believe what they believe, but the theory goes something like this. Gary had written a script that was going to make people very angry and may even put his life in jeopardy. Perhaps the people in the government Gary had been working with informed him that if he released the script, his life would be over, literally. Gary's friends also know that he had become very disillusioned with Hollywood. In the later years of his career, Gary would be hired to rework scripts or punch up other people's screenplays, and then he wouldn't even get his name in the credits. And he was angry at the way writers are treated and even stolen from. I mean, we're still seeing that now with the current writer strike. So the theory goes, what if Gary said to the government people, you can have my script and I won't produce the movie, but in return, what you're going to have to do is make me disappear. What if Gary had just simply had it with the struggle and now wanted to spend, you know, the last third of his life starting over somewhere? There's a clue that plays into this theory. When authorities gave Wendy back all of Gary's belongings, his wallet among other items, inside Gary's wallet were all of his credit cards and the cash he'd had on him at the time, but there were four photos of Wendy that were missing. Wendy and others knew that Gary always carried these photos of Wendy with him and those photos were missing. Did he take them with him for something to remember her by? There's something else. Wendy has a daughter and Gary was close to this daughter. On the day that Wendy's daughter graduated from law school, a woman approached Wendy and told her that she worked in the administration office at the school. This woman informed Wendy that the office had received several messages and then a call from a man who was very insistent that he be given information about Wendy's daughter. The man wanted to know if Wendy's daughter was graduating from law school that day. Now, the school wasn't sure if they should give out information, but this man was really insistent about wanting to know if this particular student was graduating. Wendy feels the caller may have been Gary, making sure that his disappearance and death, what people thought was his death, hadn't affected Wendy's daughter to the point that she hadn't ended up graduating. Wendy no longer believes that Gary is dead. She did at first, but she has since changed her mind. Finding out all of this new information changed her. Wendy's friends say all of this has really changed her. She has a sadness about her. She misses Gary and seems to be hurt by the notion that he would disappear out of her life. So at this point in the documentary, Matthew is still in California and he's working very closely with Wendy. He even states that he has come to think of Wendy kind of as a mother figure. Matthew feels he's making progress, but he knows he absolutely must speak with someone before he goes any further. 
And the person he needs to speak with is this man, Michael Sands. Michael Sands was Gary DeVore's publicist, and he knew all of the things that Gary was working on. He knew more details about the projects than most people did. Matthew Alford is convinced that Michael Sands holds the keys to unlocking the mystery surrounding Gary's disappearance, and he is convinced that Michael is involved with the CIA. As they meet, Michael tells Matthew that he was a fashion model in a former life, and he tells Matthew and the filmmaker that his life as a model was kind of a cover for him to travel the world and work for the government. When Matthew presses Michael for details, Michael just says he did all kinds of stuff. So as Matthew and the filmmaker are inside Michael's apartment, Michael's cell phone rings. Michael takes the call. When he hears who it is, he stands up and he leaves the room. And when he returns, he abruptly ends the meeting with Matthew and the filmmaker. Then you see Matthew and the crew down the hall waiting for the elevator when Michael opens the door to his apartment and peeks out and tells Matthew to come back without the camera crew. When Matthew finishes his private meeting with Michael, he returns to the camera crew and he is visibly shaken. Matthew is disturbed by Michael's demeanor and all he will say on camera is that Michael told him, give me three weeks, let me gather my information and make sure it is safe and then I will help you. Days later, Michael Sands was dead. March 2012. Matthew Alford has reached the end of the road. He returns to England, leaving Wendy upset and disappointed that he cannot answer her questions, but he needs to get home and he figures he has a few weeks to wait for Michael to get back to him. In mid-March, Matthew and Michael talk over Skype and Matthew explains that they are going to start editing the film. He would like some sort of idea as to what Michael will be adding to the story. Michael gets nervous and he tells Matthew, We've got to be really careful here. We've got to pick and choose wisely. He actually says, pick and choose the wrong stuff, you're screwed. Then he says, the agency, I mean, they're tied to everything. They really, really are. That's a direct quote from Michael. Matthew says, you know, we're the ones at risk. I'm putting the film out. It won't come back on you. And you need to do everything you can to help your friend. Michael responds, believe me, they can make life really, really miserable for you and for me. They give you that knock on the door. Matthew says, there's no reason you can't fight this and win. We can get proper justice. He says, you have to believe that you're doing the right thing, fighting for your friend, this man that you knew. And then there's a long pause and Michael tells Matthew, I'll help you. Two weeks later, on March 24th, 2012, Michael Sands walks into a deli in Los Angeles. He wanders around for a bit and is seen on security camera doing some shopping. Then he walks up to the deli counter as the attendant puts out a fresh plate of deli meat samples. Michael takes a sample, puts it in his mouth and kind of seems to chew it up. Moments later, he collapses onto the ground. EMTs are called and they work on Michael Sands. He is somewhat revived and then taken to Cedar sinai Hospital where he is placed in a medically induced coma to prevent brain swelling. Michael died 13 days later on April 6, 2012. Did he choke or was it something else? Matthew is really discouraged and he kind of disappears and the film crew can't get in touch with him. When Matthew is told that the film crew is almost finished and that they need to do an exit interview, Matthew tells them to come to his house. This strange story now gets stranger. When the film crew shows up at Matthew's house, Matthew is dressed as a clown and he insists on wearing his clown costume, complete with red nose, for the interview. Confused, the director asks what is going on and Matthew states, I want to do everything I can to ruin my credibility for this film. I don't want anyone to take anything I've done here seriously and I don't want anyone to believe me. That's what happens. Matthew does say, Gary DeVore did not die in a car accident in 1997. He was not the victim of a car accident. The filmmaker asks, how do you know this? And Matthew replies, that is all I have to say and all I will ever say publicly about this investigation or this case. The filmmaker asks again, how do you know this? And Matthew replies, it's become very clear. And that, my friends, is what we know. 
Gary DeVore has never surfaced. There is no clue as to who the man in the car might be, if it's not Gary. If it is Gary, we don't know why his hands were removed or where his laptop went, why his dental records that didn't match him made it through the autopsy findings into the report, why the lights were off in the car, why the car was found in a place that had already been searched. But I can tell you one thing, if you had a man that you wanted to fake a death on and he had a very distinctive feature, like a finger that stuck out horizontally, you'd have to remove the hands of the guy you put in his place. We don't know what happened on that night on a lonesome freeway decades ago. But what we do know is there is a shadow world that exists in ours. A world of secrets and lies and powerful people who have one face in the daylight and another in the dark and who do anything to make sure that the world never knows who they really are when they think no one else is looking. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Hit the like button if you like the video and subscribe if you want to see more from me. You can also join my Patreon. Patreon is really what's keeping the channel alive at this point. And in the end, we have a big goal. There are thousands of sexual assault kits sitting in refrigeration that have never been tested because the police will not allocate money to test those kits. So we want to raise money to donate to police departments. We can pick and choose the cases that have those kits and we want to get them tested. They cost between $500 and $750 a kit. There's two reasons to get them tested. One, obviously, we want to help try and solve the case the DNA is connected to. Two, it gets that perpetrator's DNA in the system in case that perpetrator has committed other crimes. I'm not going to get there alone, but with your help, I can. I want you to know how much I appreciate you being here. I wouldn't still be here if it wasn't for the feedback that I get from you guys, and I really enjoy our interaction. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I will see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.